There are two quite distinct reasons why we need to think about the university when we talk about the subject of work and faith. One of them is that this is the place where our future workers are developed, and we need a sound foundation for that. The second is the university is itself a workplace. And what we see is that these two ideas intertwine, and I'd like to share a bit with you about that. I want to remind you, though, that in the rapidly changing world we have where every institution has been turned on its head, the university remains much as it has. Here's a picture of a 14th century classroom, and that looks remarkably like my classroom last week. <laughs> <laughs> there are some people paying rapt attention, there are some people talking and some sleeping, and that's kind of the way it is. <laughs> but you know, I believe that we are at a major inflection point. And I'm going to talk to you about the reasons why we're at that inflection point and what I think that implies for the university and for all of its structure. And you will see that this will get into a lot of different areas of the university. And I'm going to just try and give you some illustrations of this. If any of you have read the works of Clayton Christensen, you would know that he says at major inflection points, what usually happens is that existing organizations die and new organizations take over. I don't know if that will happen here, although many authors I have read suggest that it is likely that 20 to 50 percent of the existing educational institutions, colleges and universities will be gone in 30 years. So why, why does this happen and what does it mean? I'd like to touch on three things. And it's interesting to me that the first two push universities to do more, and the last one pushes them to do it in a completely different way. And so we're going to have to think about all three issues. My original thought was that what we heard before on seminaries would be very different from what we hear on universities, but I think you're going to see some common themes. So let me talk about content, because this helps us understand some good things that are going on in the Faith at Work movement. And if you don't mind, I'm going to start very personally. In 2002, at Seattle Pacific University, in the School of Business, our new dean, Jeff Van Duzer, gathered us together and said, we keep hearing about what the purpose of business is, and it's about making lots of money. Is that really what the Bible says about the purpose of business? Because if it isn't, we better rethink our curriculum. And so we gathered for a couple of summers. We read papers. We listened to talks. We argued. Um, and in the end, we came to broad consensus, though not complete. And that meant that Jeff uh, ended up writing a book of his view of this. It's a wonderful book, Why Business Matters to God. I'd encourage you to read it if you haven't already. It's soundly biblically based, and it does develop this case for the purpose of business. I would say that he drew two broad conclusions for the purpose of business. The first is that a business is there to create great products and services meeting real needs in the market. And the second is, as in Genesis 1 and 2, where God created us to work and have fulfilling jobs, the goal is that businesses can provide some of those jobs. And so business plays those roles. The one we argued about and never got full agreement on was uh, the role of business in creating economic value. Several of us held out for that, and Jeff viewed it more as a constraint. So there are differences of opinion, as there always are in an academic world. Now, it's interesting to me that about this same time, some of our friends in the Catholic tradition were having the same discussions. And it turns out that recently we had a visit from Michael Naughton, a professor from uh, University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis. And he shared with us their conclusions. Their conclusions were, that business purpose is all about good products, good jobs, and good wealth. You can see a lot of similarity there. In fact, he, like Jeff, had a lot of qualifying what is a good product, what does it mean to create a good job, and how do you deal with the wealth that you create. Now here's the challenge. As a Christian community, we can come around this point and we can say, well, we think that we ought to look at business differently. But we have a society that has a different view of what business is all about, and it's all about making more money. 
And so how do we send a message? Often we can't just say, well, let's look at the scripture and see what it has to say. So we have to begin to translate these arguments into a language that can be understood. Now, the czar of this way of thinking in modern times is Milton Friedman, a Nobel Prize winning economist at University of Chicago. And he created an argument that started in the academy, slowly drifted into business, to the point where it, I can remember the time when it created the mantra at the Boeing company, this is what we have shifted our purpose to be, maximizing shareholder value, subject to the constraints of the law and ethical norms. Any of you that have ever been to a business school have heard that before. Now, these are quite in contrast to each other. And so the question is, how do we think about that difference? Well, as Christians, we now have a sound foundation for saying it's about something else, but how do we communicate that? So we've been looking at arguments for how we deal directly with this. We have a paper out that lists about 10 good arguments for why Milton Friedman was wrong. I one time had an opportunity to share this at University of Chicago and entitled the talk, Why Milton Friedman Was Wrong. It was very fun. Um, but let me give you a couple of the arguments. I've been trained as a mathematician, so here's one of the arguments that kind of jumped off the page at me. You know, if you try and maximize something subject to constraints, where does the solution lie? Well, mathematicians have studied this problem, and they can tell you for sure it lies on the boundary of the constraint. So what is that mantra, maximize subject to these constraints, where does it take you? It takes you to the boundary of the law and the boundary of ethics, which is exactly where we've been over the last 20 years in seeing all the ethical failures in business. But you know, there's some other reasons as well. I turn to another secular uh, argument, Daniel Kahneman himself, a Nobel Prize winner in economics. And he wrote this fabulous book called Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a very fun book to read. It takes a long time, it's thick, and it's got lots of arguments, but let me give you a couple of his arguments. He did a series of social experiments, and one of his experiments said, you know, what I found is that when people focus only on money, they become isolated and selfish. Wow. Now, in the Bible, we could say, well, that's what Paul wrote to Timothy. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Well, he did it through social experiments, another argument against focusing only on money. He also pointed out, though, that we believe somehow in economics that people will always act in their own self-interest. You know, we don't. In fact, Daniel Kahneman shows in a wonderful way that people do not act necessarily in their own self-interest. And so there's an emerging topic called behavioral economics that tries to take this into account. And I believe that this is changing the way we think about these structures. So understanding the purpose of business is one illustration. But another one is leadership. And you know, we have this model of leadership of driving toward the goal and getting people to carry your load and all of those things so nicely depicted in this picture. But then we have models of, from our Christian faith of servant leadership. How does that fit with servant leadership? And then we have models of great CEOs. I'm thankful that Bill Pollard is here with us at this conference. And Bill modeled in a beautiful way what it means to be a servant leader. And Max Dupree and so many others. And you look at that and you say, there's got to be a better way. Well, fortunately, Bill Pollard was able to encourage uh, Joseph Marciarello. And he wrote this wonderful book called Drucker's Lost Art of Management, where the theme developed is how do we think about management as a liberal art? Not as driving toward a task only, but as engaging a community, or to use Bill Pollard's language, to being uh, responsible as a leader to help shape a moral community. What a difference that makes. And in fact, the ironic thing is it did it from the work of Peter Drucker, who himself was a believer, who was a guru in the business field, and Joseph Marciarello in this book drew on so many of Peter Drucker's works. Or let me take one other example from a different area of the university. Um, Catherine Hayhoe is a professor at Texas A&M University, a secular university. 
She's been interested in the subject of climate change. You could Google this, but recently she was interviewed by Bill Moyers talking about climate change. And what you saw from that interview was fascinating. She beautifully talked about her Christian faith. She beautifully talked about the defense of the science of climate change. And she challenged people in the academic and Christian community to think about this differently. A wonderful model. So we can begin to start thinking about shaping content. But there's another area, and that is character. And if you look back at universities over history, what you find is that universities were founded to shape character. And that's a message that they have lost. And many Christian colleges carry this on, but it is getting lost. And so the idea of thinking about the shaping of character and the responsibility of universities in this area is something that is being lost and needs to be recovered. But it needs to be recovered against a backdrop of another troubling issue, and that is the issue of cost. And I heard that mentioned regarding seminaries, and it's certainly true at universities. Any of you that have paid for the tuition of your children know something about this story. And I tried to quantify it a bit, and I didn't see anyone from University of Illinois at this conference, and so I decided to take University of Illinois as the model. <laughs> In 2001, the tuition was $4,000 a year. In 2010, it was over $10,000 a year. That's a factor of two and a half times. Way over inflation. If you back it up to uh, another 10 years, you see about the same trend. Norm Augustin, the former chairman at Lockheed Martin, wanted to get the attention of people on the price of a fighter jet aircraft. So what he did was he looked at the cost and he projected it to the future. And in 2120, he said the cost of a single fighter airplane would exceed the military budget of any country. And then he had a fanciful essay where he described warfare with only one airplane on either side. <laughs> so let me tell you that if you project this forward, a single year at University of Illinois in 2090 will be about $1.6 million a year. Obviously, this is not a sustainable trend. And then you go to another factor, and that is that the number of high school graduates that are eligible to come in has flattened. And then you take another factor that middle class wages are declining. And then you take another factor that new university systems are emerging. And you have all sorts of trouble for universities. So what is the answer to this cost question? Well. A lot of people say, well, it's online education. We have technology now, and it can make this inexpensive. But there's a problem here. And it's the reason that I started with content and with character. If you're going to continue to do the creative work to draw out from the scripture and to interpret in a language of, the, of our society what uh, all of this means, how do you fund that? when you decide you're going to pick up a MOOC from some secular university and that's the basis of your instruction. How do you do character development online? You know, the, that's a challenge because character development is best done in community. So how are we going to solve this problem and how do we think about the goal? We often say, well, the goal is jobs, but you know, skills deteriorate at a very rapid rate these days. And it's not just about jobs, it's critical thinking, it's citizenship, and it's Christian character for our Christian students. And so the challenge that we face is, how do we achieve good scholarship, creative scholarship, development of character, content that really makes a difference, that is ongoing throughout a person's life, not just a one-time shot and then they're off to the job forever. That's a model that's gone. How do we do this at a dramatically lower cost? I don't know how to solve this problem. We hope the workshop will make some progress tomorrow. <laughs> but I can tell you this. At the Boeing Company, we took 17 months to make an airplane. And we wanted to get that down a great deal. You can't snip 5% here and 10% there and get that down. So we had a project. How do you create a two-week airplane? And what that meant is throwing out everything and rethinking the model. And I think that's what's going to have to happen in education. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Al. Thank you so much. I, I'm going to try to merge a couple of questions that came in. And so here's sort of the first part, and then I'll, I'll form it into a, a question for you. question came in uh, about the public view of the purpose of business versus the rise of conscious capitalism. John, John Mackey and Whole Foods and that whole initiative. And, and let me ask this question. Um, can there, I go one at a time or shall I merge what, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the second one, and maybe okay. you can deal with them one at a time or just think about them together. There are a lot of challenges, I think even more broadly than social capitalism, to Milton Friedman's philosophy. Um, what do you think's behind all of that, all of that um, discourse right now? Um, and, um, and are you hopeful? Yeah, I, I'm actually very hopeful on this question of the purpose of business because I think that everyone is beginning to realize that this model that we've had for a while is, broken, is breaking down. I'd like to think, and I'm hopeful to think, that maybe some of the work that Christians have been engaged in over time in rethinking this model is actually having some impact. But we know it's coming from a lot of different angles as well. And there's no question that the rise of an idea around B corporations that John has uh, played a big role in, the rise of social consciousness in, in uh, business, is actually starting to change this thing. And so I think it's great that it, that it can do that. I do believe, though, as Christians, we need to be watching this all the time. And we need to constantly be looking for where is this taking us, what is our message, and how do we play a role in reshaping it. So I am hopeful. Um, unfortunately, the last question is harder than the first one about how this university reshaping is going to go on. And uh, I'm hopeful there, too, because I think we're creative people. But I think it does call on Christians to say, yeah, you know, part of where we're going from here we're, we've made some good progress in integrating our faith in our work. How do we get this creative energy going toward rethinking some of these very challenging problems? And my hope is in this area that a lot of good minds are going to go to work at this. And I believe we can address it with God's help.